something that both James and I have noticed has really come out of your lectures on postmodernism, and in particular on Nietzsche, would be the use of the word uh, ressentiment. Uh, ressentiment, see, si. yes. And how that plays forward today in terms of being yes. the root of a lot of... Yeah, that's, a, that's another thing. Uh, yeah, aside from these uh, historical and uh, metaphysical, epistemological, biological currents, uh, and in Nietzsche's thinking, you do see him evolving sometimes in a more metaphysical direction, sometimes in a more kind of reductive naturalistic or reductive materialistic direction as well as, as his time goes on. But uh, it, it, uh, I think there's a lot of truth to this, to say that Nietzsche is one of the founders of psychology as a, as a science. And it's interesting that he is one generation before Freud, and Freud, we know, read Nietzsche. Freud did his first major publication in uh, 1900, exactly 1900. I think the book actually came out in 1899, mm. toward the end of the year, but the publisher put 1900 on it because, you know, the new century, and that's a little bit more, more dramatic and so forth. But this idea that there are deep, uh, instinctual, conflictual structures going on under the mind, and that they come out in kind of a neurotic, strange, perverse form in our conscious minds, and also that our conscious minds, our, our reason, our, our egos are relatively weak, Johnny-come-lately evolutionary f uh, factors, and so we can largely see that what we call reasoning really is just after the fact rationalization, and that's not really uh, important to understand what the human being is. And so we have to do these deep dives into some pretty dark, subconscious, unconscious, below the surface uh, uh, places. And then when you get down there, uh, you find typically some, some pretty dark stuff. Now, you no, know, in the Freudian version, he wants to reduce it more analytically to, you know, instinctual aggression and instinctual sexuality and kind of combining those two, you know, aggressive sexuality. Uh, and that's, that's a very reductionistic explanation. Nietzsche has a more sophisticated uh, version of it. He sees more varieties of forms for, for human beings, but it is true that that's where he's looking. And he wants to argue that for, for most people, uh, particularly for people who aren't that smart, for people who aren't that courageous, uh, people who uh, are much more conformist, uh, you know, kind of the, their, their natural whatever it is that makes them a human being, they don't feel able to or willing to express that and discover mm. who they are. So a lot of stuff gets driven down uh, inside of them. And uh, they, they can't admit even to themselves that they are not being human beings and, and realizing their potential. Right. So uh, in addition to whatever is just this natural, instinctual, seething stuff that's going to be going on and with all of the conflicts and so forth, a lot of people uh, are, are, are going to be uh, kind, of, kind of oppressed. I don't want to use this language too freightedly right now by social conformist forces and so it's, it's going to be pushed down under them but they're also going to do a lot of repressing themselves and so there's going to be a lot of dark nasty territory that comes out there and now this uh, then becomes you know, a little bit uh, uh, more of a sociological claim but Nietzsche wants to argue that the vast majority of people don't have what it takes really to take any sort of human potentiality that they have and do something significant with it, right? Uh, so instead they are going to be vacillating weak types of people and they're going to be worried about the, what their neighbors think about them and just, you know, hoping that uh, they can get along with their, uh, you know, with their bosses and their mothers-in-law, right? And, and so forth. And that's just, just, just the way they are. But they still are human beings, right? And all of that uh, natural energy that human beings have is just going to be seething inside and it's going to eventually come out in ugly forms in envies and resentments and petty passive aggressiveness and so on and he's just a brilliant diagnostician right of a lot of the forms in which this uh, this can take so he has a borrow word here the ressentiment which is not really the english resentment but it's kind of in the in the same way so just you have to think of yourself as a kind of a weak person right I don't know, you, 
you, you could never stand up to your mom or your dad, right? And uh, but you always kind of resented it, and you kind of didn't like yourself because you never quite stood up to your mom and dad, right? And maybe you're still we're painting a stereotype here. You know, you're 28 years old and you're still living in your mom's basement, right? And <laughs> 38 uh, nowadays, but you know, <laughs> okay, whatever your age is. <laughs> and you're uh, and you didn't really uh, find anything that you were passionate about in in high school, so you didn't really get any marketable skills and so you got some sort of dead-end job and uh, the boss makes you do all kinds of stuff and you, you you really hate your work and you feel that it's dehumanizing but you don't really have enough ambition to you're oppressed do it. well you uh, but that's going to be your one of your cover stories yeah that's right? your cover story that's right that i'm that i'm oppressed you know it was the system it was my bad parenting yeah. it was you know it wasn't it, me. It, it was capitalism didn't give me my, my $100,000 a year job that I know secretly that I'm really, really deserving of. Yeah. Right. So uh, all of those things, though, are going to be, and Nietzsche is brilliant at diagnosing these things. You know, he talks about socialists, right? He talks about anti-Semites, and he talks about <laughs> the 19th, uh, uh, 19th century equivalent of you know, the 30-year-old still living in their mom's basements uh, in all of these forms. So you will know, really, that... It was your weakness that has led you to be this pathetic loser of a man. But it's very hard for people to admit to themselves that it's their own weakness that made them the pathetic losers that they are. Right? Uh, and so they will start inventing rationalizations and cover stories and so forth. And they'll have to invest a lot of energy to protect any minimal vest vestige of, of self-esteem that they can have that it's not me. Right? It's, it's something out there right? in, the, in the system and so forth. Now, where the resentment is really going to come out, though, is whenever they see somebody who's not a pathetic loser, right? <laughs> they see somebody right, driving along in his, well, I can't use an anachronistic example, right? uh, you know, instead of having to walk to work, this guy's going along in a beautiful carriage right, pulled by four horses. Right? The and horses' then, names are Ferrari. <laughs> the horses' names are Ferrari and Lamborghini and uh, right and so forth. <laughs> yeah, it's all cool Italian names. Yeah. right? that's right. And so you hate that guy. Yep. That's right. And uh, here's another guy over there, right, who has a beautiful woman on his arm, and he's off to the opera, right, or or whatever, and he's dressed well. And meanwhile, you are right doing whatever. That person, even though if you don't know that guy, you hate him. Right? Mm -hmm. Because he's a living example and a living show. He's, a, a, he's pointing out to you uh, your failure. And you can't stand that because it smashes the self-image that you're trying to, uh, trying to create. And so what you necessarily then want to do is you have to smash that. You want that to go away. In any way, that, and a lot of times it's going to come out just in, you're going to mutter to yourself, oh, he got lucky, he came mm -hmm. from the right, it's all the game is rigged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then, of course, uh, uh, if you have a way with words, you'll become very clever with words and find ways to insult this person and spread rumors about the person and, and so on. Uh, so that all of that ressentiment uh, is what Nietzsche is very good at, at diagnosing. And we see a certain amount of that picked up by, uh, by Freud. Interestingly, Nietzsche is a contemporary of Dostoevsky, the right. great Russian novelist who also is oh. brilliant at diagnosing all of these dysfunctional psychological types. So a lot is going on in the psychological territory uh, as well. And I think you know, <laughs> as much as I disagree with Nietzsche fundamentally on all of his philosophical, he was a brilliant diagnostic diagnostician on a lot of the psychological pathologies that are still with us as we know.